Welcome to the making of Balanced Animal. Presented by Nancy Dunn, Della Saran, Alex Dees, Christy Randolph. The Making a Balanced Animal, presented by Nancy Dunn, Della Serna, Alex Dees, and Christy Randolph.
<laughs> Testing. Kind of like Nancy, they don't know us, and they can put a microphone me. here, right? Is that loud enough? How about there? I'm not going to talk very loud. <laughs> That's why. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me? I don't want to be yelling into that because I talk. So did you want to break it up into nutrition? What did you Just take questions and go from there. Thank you, everybody, for coming uh, back to this next seminar. Um, up here, we've got Della Serna, Nancy Dunn, Alexandra Dees, and Christy Randolph. They're going to discuss and give us some insight on the making of a complete balanced Texas Longhorn. We're going to look at a group of females first and go over femininity, conformation, bone structure, utter. Uh, then we'll jump to a, a group of males, discuss a lot of similar things, but we're going to discuss their anatomy instead. Um, so thank you, ladies, and here you go. <laughs> Give them a little bit of background on yourself, too. All right. Um, I've had Longhorns since uh, two, 2000. I've had Longhorns since 2005. And uh, started in minis because I had a small piece of property and then got a big ranch in 2008 and moved on to the, the big ones. Um, we're in eastern Oregon. This is actually my cow in the photograph of our country. It's high desert. So everything, whatever I talk about here comes from that environment. Um, we have a hard winter down to 20 below. Uh, in December and January, and then a, a warm summer that allows us to grow a lot of grass, as you can see in this picture. So we, um, I have about 150 pregnant cows right now, cows and heifers. That's about the size I'd like to stay. It's a great size because it lets you experiment with bulls and bloodlines. And um, so I, I can touch on nutrition and how we do things, you see, I like to see my 18-month-old heifers looking about like that in condition before I turn them out with the bull uh, next month. And um, I can cover how we do things in our country. It may not apply for a lot of you, but, um, but I'm happy to talk about it for those that are in similar conditions to mine. And um, I'm sure I'll think of some other things to say about it, but I'll pass you on down to Christy. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to see there's enough interest here that we can actually do this. I was a little worried with all the extracurricular going on out there that it's like, I don't want to hear four women talk. I want to go watch cows get measured. We're kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from Alex um, with regard to being in Central Texas, and a lot of you are from Central Texas, so you know that we have kind of the opposite. We have some really hard summers and mild winters. And so our feeding is going to be 
based on what's available at the time. I agree with Alex. I think that this is a good specimen at 18 months old to turn out with a bull because you absolutely have to have them in tip-top shape if you want them to produce for you what you want. Uh, John and I have been in the business for probably, I'm going to age myself here, going on about 30 years. I was a small child. I was a child bride uh, when he met me, realized he couldn't live without me. Uh, or 14, you know, <laughs> you know. But anyway, anyway, so we've been doing it for a number of years, and very similar to what Alex was saying, I can speak only to our experience and what has worked for us as far as our feeding regimen and the way we go, and that's what I'll probably focus on. So happy that you're here. Looking forward to what you guys have as far as input for us, and I will turn it over to Nancy and let her take it from there. And I come from a totally different part of the country because I'm in uh, central Alabama, which is a long way from here, just like Oregon is a long way from here. Um, our climate there, um, hot, humid, um, wet most of the time. We have high humidity in the summer and in the winter. So humidity issues and heat issues are concerns for breeding, calving, et cetera, because we have to plan when we want those calves born. They do not do well to be born in the summertime, so we try to calve in the fall. I have been involved in the, in the business since 1989 and got started um, mainly because we were in the team roping business, and I was tired of buying steers every year and selling them when they got too big to rope, and one year I decided to buy heifers, longhorn heifers, and just absolutely fell in love with them, and from there uh, totally disbanded my... <laughs> my commercial longhorn herd and started a registered program shortly thereafter and been going at it ever since. Um, I agree with Alex as far as this heifer is concerned. She's big bodied. She looks mature um, where she would be able to um, probably conceive pretty quickly and that is something that you, you do need to be concerned about is their body condition and their maturity. Occasionally you'll have heifers that might be smaller in body size or look a little more immature than this heifer. Um, I wouldn't hesitate on those heifers maybe to hold them a little longer if I didn't think they were quite ready. Um, some of the genetics that we have are a little earlier or later maturing, and I would sort of base that on that individual. Now, obviously, we can't breed every heifer at a totally separate breeding time, but you can kind of kind of group them just a little bit. Everybody has sort of a different plan on that. Some put them in to calve by two. Some people calve at two and a half, and some don't worry about calving until they're about three. So there's lots of issues there we can talk about if y'all have an interest in that. Um, I'm sure we're going to have lots of good questions as we move along. Um, I come from South Texas, so it's a little similar to what you'll see in Central Texas, but we run a whole lot less water, even though we're, we're close to the coast. Um, I'm with El Coyote Ranch, and I, I have the fortune of, uh, we've been on that ranch since I was nine months old. So I grew up there. I grew up seeing a lot of stuff, but we are a very diverse operation. So we predominantly run stalker kettle, um, but we also have purebred herds in the Texas Longhorn. We run about uh, about 170 mature cows, and that's not including our yearlings um, that we have all and weanlings. So that's it's kind of a bit of numbers, but we also run a purebred Santa Gertrudis herd, and that's where I started out. Um, I showed Santa Gertrudis for um, our show cattle string. Um, and then also, you know, build our cow-calf operation through that, which we run a smaller number, um, but just as much quality as we do with the Longhorn. So we're kind of split in both the beef cattle sector, and while Texas Longhorn is still part of that, the, there's a lot of different aspects that we can take from what these wonderful cattle do. What would you like? Would you like us to sort of describe a typical uh, sort of program, like from the beginning, how things look, you know, first pregnancy for the most part? But I was being a little flip about it. I mean, that's a, a big, stout, mature-looking heifer that you could do anything with. You could IVF her right now, which I may actually do th with this one. I'm going to do some IVF with a few, and she's in great shape for that right now. This photo's from just a... Yeah, in June, and she just continues to develop. 
So, yeah, I mean, that's a starting point. Um, they don't all look like that, but that's, for me, that's kind of a target. I still want them to look like Longhorns, not like Angus, but I'd like, I'd like them to start out looking like that. In what regard? Well, something I think, and, and I breed a heritage breed in horses, so I've thought a lot about this in horses. Preserving heritage and old-fashioned type in in a in the breeds that we have here, and uh, so I think that we have to recognize what's distinctly Longhorn in our cattle, and we're we have been emphasizing, uh, you know, better structure, more mass, more beef. Um, you know, things that are, are we think of generally in the whole beef cattle world. Right. But we have to be careful not to lose the things that are distinctive to the longhorn and not and not basically turn them into a, <coughs> a speckled up um, beef Angus crop. Yeah, beef. so I still want to see, I want to see that distinctive head, that, that look in the eye, that, that beautiful long mm -hmm. face. Yeah, this one, this heifer, I would say you can't see. She's a little short in the neck, but, um, but yeah, that you want to see want, that right. that clean look, that a uh, little bit of of ranginess. You want them want them to look like they can travel 25 miles in a day in rough country with, and um, I think our pelvic structures are very important. We all talk about having bigger hips, meatier hips, and the longhorn, but you don't want to lose that the the higher the that cascading fish hook tail set and the slightly higher pelvis. A little slope from the hooks to the yeah, pins. exactly. We exactly. hear all the time in the show arena when we get a beef judge to come and look at our cattle. The first thing they comment is on how level they are from hooks to pins. <coughs> longhorn is not supposed to be perfectly level from hooks to pins. Their reproductive system is not made that way. They have to have a slight slope. I'm not talking about a 90 degree drop, but they need a slight slope from their hooks to the pins. That's the way God designed them. We didn't do that. God did that. They're selective. Yeah. And they have a wonderful fish hook. God did that. We didn't do that to them. So we don't want to alter what the natural state is. And while we're talking about that, can I deviate just a minute and talk about feed programs? And this may be kind of off the wall, but I want to caution every single person that has show cattle that you're going to run out into a show arena in front of a beef judge, a longhorn judge, or whoever. If you feel like that that heifer or that cow needs to be pinned up in a small area so that they can get 25 pounds of grain a day, and all of a sudden you notice their udders filling out, and they've got this deep, round brisket that's fat. You put udder, you put fat in an udder, and you can't get rid of it. And what appears to be a wonderful milking udder, you're going to look at your calf that she's got on the ground and wonder, what, what happened? What happened? Because you've got an udder that's filled with fat, and she's not producing the amount of milk she needs to do. You start seeing pones. Women will appreciate this more than you guys. We get pones on the outside of our thighs here, just like she could get pones up next to her tail set. That's fat. It's not healthy. If you start seeing a brisket that's expanding, you can't get rid of it. You can starve her down, but you can't get rid of it. So good nutrition and overfeeding are two different things. And that's my pet peeve of the day, and I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> well, and kind of to go off of what Miss Randolph was saying on, you know, good nutrition and overfeeding, it's just not economical for you to go in and say, well, I'm going to feed to this. Yes, you can, you can go in and say, I'm going to have a, a pen where I, I have my sale cows that are ready, but we're not what we do. We don't feed them all the time they um they're made to survive and we have big country and and rough country that they have to go through brush that they have to clear and mother nature has allowed them to do that and to maybe we you know we have those easy keepers that they look at dirt and they're going to gain so you know you have to find that fine line where you're not overfeeding 
to what they can actually do through their own capacity. Okay, well, <laughs> I haven't tried it. <laughs> we, we, try, we haven't tried it, although I'm sure we've all seen, seen it. it. We've, seen yeah. it. we've seen it. We've seen we it. We have seen it. Um, again, from a personal perspective, and I'll, I'm going to kind of get away from what Justin just asked, when, when we go into our feeding program, we leave, and this is going to sound really odd based on what I just said, our babies, from the time they're born, are they have a bunk feeder that has a 14% protein feed. And it's got vitamins and minerals, but it's a 14% feed. They start on that when they're ready to, to find that bunk feeder in the back, and they'll be probably two or three months old by the time they realize it's there. It's just a creep feed. You can get it from Purina. You can get it from Nutrina. You can get it probably from where Alex buys her food. <coughs> but we keep that out available all the time. And what we've discovered is that at the time that we wean these babies, they go into a separate pen area on that same creep feed. The only thing they're missing is mama's milk, but it's the same feed as what they've been accustomed to eating. When they get ready and they're weaned and we get ready to pick out what we think we want to show, guess what we feed them? That same 14% feed. They get their, we put out minerals, loose minerals. We keep salt blocks with iodine and zinc out. We keep uh, salt meal out all the time. They've got these things available to them. And what we've discovered is because it's there all the time, they'll eat what they need and go away. It's not like they stand. a horse will stand and eat until it explodes. These guys will not. They'll eat what they need. They'll take what they need. And then they go. But there's not the stress of changing feeds just because they're going to go into a show arena or into a futurity or wherever we decide they need to be. So we have found that that reduces some of the stress, even at weaning time, because nothing has really changed except being away from mama. So we don't see a lot of under condition in these animals. You can tell by looking at your animal if she's under condition because you're going to see a ridge along the backbone. You're going to see what we, we will call, for lack of a better term, and I take this from the John Randolph book of euphemisms, hatchet eyes. They're narrow. That's going to create a problem in your reproductive area because they don't have the capacity to spit that calf out. So you want to be sure. If you start seeing a cow that's emaciated, you need to start checking what kind of grass do you have. Do I need to be supplementing with hay right now even though it may be late spring? Maybe you're, you've had a lot of rain and there's no nutrient in your grass anymore. But if you see one that's starting to get emaciated, it's going to affect everything. Your reproduction is going to go way, way down. If she does have a baby, she's not going to be able to do a good job as you want, excuse me, as you want for her to. One other thing that I found out, I, I love these things because you're talking to your neighbors and folks that are in your general area. And I'm going to, I think you could probably address this better. I found out, um, talking to Josie Becker early today, she's with Strudolf Ranch, that they had bought a cow from the East Coast, brought her into Central Texas, and the cow went down. And they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her until somebody snapped to and realized that she had come from such different climates that she had a thiamine deficiency. Hmm. So they had to infuse her with thiamine, like I think Josie said, every day for a month or whatever, but the cow would be walking and it would look like her legs would just give out. It had to do with some function in the brain that would tell her things aren't right and she would literally just go down and then throw her head back. But it was a thiamine deficiency. So if you're bringing a cow from the, from the far west coast over to central Texas or even the east coast where you have drastic temperature changes, she came from the high in the 60s, we were at 105 degrees, and her body couldn't handle it. So 
If you see one kind of stumbling around and you got her off the east, off the west coast and you brought her into a totally different temperature range, that would be something for you to check. I just found that interesting and I'm gonna turn it over to somebody else now because I've talked too much. Um, I'll, I'll go over our feeding program just, uh, just because I'm ready to do, do that. <laughs> um, we grow alfalfa commercially and so um, all my cattle grow up on a high pro in a high protein environment because that's really all we have to offer them. And I think that, and you guys know this because you guys supplement with your protein cakes and cubes and that kind of thing, but if I had to pick one element that if they're shorted on that, you're gonna suffer for generations, it's gonna be protein. Yeah. And they've determined now and, and this is out of the, the beef industry, but in this case, it applies to our longhorns. If you deprive mother cows of critical levels of protein and minerals, any time during the pregnancy, you're gonna impact another two generations beyond her in her daughters. And it used to be the old timers would say, you gotta feed them while they're lactating, and then you gotta feed them immediately before they calve, but in that, middle point, for us it would be midwinter, mm -hmm. um, you can let her go to just a background nutritional uh, program and save some money on your on your feed supplements and stuff because the, the thought was that she didn't really need that. The calf isn't that big inside her. She's no longer nursing. She can kind of just cruise along for a little while. But recent research, they have been able to track the impacts of reduced nutrition for three generations. and. Of course, they're looking for every little thing that's the edge in a beef producer. But if you're raising horn and selling cattle for money based on their horn, that is your that is what your product is. And um, so I I think you'll see the impact in horn growth, if, if, and along with all the other parameters that we measure. So uh, I emphasize protein. I actually don't have to feed, and I don't feed really any grain at all to my cattle because um, our grass and hay is, is, is very potent because it's dormant half the year, so it concentrates everything into the summertime. Um, but I do focus on minerals uh, to balance our high protein diets. Uh, I do use a little bit of a liquid supplement in the depths of winter, which has a bit more sugars and carbohydrates to help them stay warm at 10 below. And um, and that's pretty much it. I use Multimin now, I injectable. I try and get it into all the young cattle at least three times a year, the adult cattle hopefully twice a year. And that seems to keep them all at a high plane and they utilize the protein that we have. And for us, protein is the cheapest feed I can get my hands on. So they just get all of that that they can eat and they they develop very well under that regimen and I'm very pleased. And I have to think that the horn material that we're all focused on is a protein-based material. So w putting them in an excess protein state uh, seems to be the best way to cover all your bases and to make sure you get your maximum horn growth. And um, I li like I said, I like to see them look pretty, pretty good at 18 months. I don't breed before that. <coughs> and I don't get real bothered if, if in the first round of this fall breeding they don't take at 18 months but they take with the bull six months later when I try them again I don't worry about it I think this breed is not intended to be pregnant at 12 months this is n never what they focused on down in South Texas when they were running wild so it doesn't bother me a whole lot uh, I'd rather see them develop physically grow some horn um, and be set up to be good strong mothers because they bred when their body was ready to breed rather than they were when they were forced to breed. Um, so that, that's my heifer program. I want to just um, tag on to what um, Alex just said. I've had people ask me occasionally about selecting heifers to put in faturities to show and breeding those heifers to be faturity heifers and how you make those decisions. Well, I just have to be honest about that. I'm not raising heifers to be paturity heifers. I'm raising heifers to be replacements to go into my brood cow herd. And if you will evaluate those heifers 
and raise them for that reason, you can get some paturity heifers out of that group mm -hmm. because they're going to be structurally sound. They're going to be attractive. They're going to be feminine. They're going to be able to breed, have the capacity to carry a calf. They better have a good udder and can milk or they won't last long around my place because that is way up high on the list for brood cow. But all of those characteristics that you look for in an animal that you would want to put in a show string or take to a futurity should have the very same characteristics, in my opinion, that you should be breeding for to go into your herd as a replacement. There should not be a difference. Attractive, colorful, adequate horn, and correct structure. And, pardon? Well, I like uniformity. It's a challenge to get it sometimes, but, um, but it is nice when that happens. But, but I think if you will approach your futurity heifers with that in mind, she can't be a futurity heifer for her entire life. At some point, she's got to go into a breeding program. And if you'll select the genetics and the individual to meet all that criteria, then when she goes into your breeding program, you're ready. I mean, you've already you've done your homework. So th that's just my strategy. I, I want to raise them to be replacements and good replacements. And if we can show them and have some fun along the way and advertise your program, show people what you're doing with your genetics, that's just an added benefit. Mm -hmm. Why don't we, since Justin's got all these pictures, just why don't we through go through them and, and just sort of critique them and we can take questions or address um, some of their, their genetics. And if y'all can see. Can y'all see that? Is that, can you can see it okay? Yeah. We're so close to that we can't see it, but, right. but it is here. Is that one of yours as well? This is one of mine. Oh um, my, I hope mine aren't on there. <laughs> all right. I told him he could do it. What's next? <laughs> this is a really nice heifer. Now, I, I can contrast her to the one that we were looking at before who was presenting her butt to it, her big round butt. This one's a little bit different bloodline, and so she has a little, she's, she's tall, she's lankier. Uh, it's hard to see in this photo because she's all marked up. She's got a little less hip like the other one has. This one probably would be one I wouldn't put in a futurity. Not because she's not an excellent cow, because I think she's actually going to be a gorgeous, tall, big cow. But the futurity seems to like that little bit more big hip, uh, round look. And this one's going to be your a little bit uh, taller and lengthier. Also, she got a little more up horn, which is going to probably turn into a big, a big laid back rolling horn as she matures. But that's how it's got to start. If you like those big horn, those cows with the grand, majestic, big curl, a lot of them have to start out looking like this. And you have to give them some time. And that's something that I, I hope we all pay attention to. We can't eliminate a high-horned young cow thinking that she's never going to be the big tip to tip star because what you're missing out on is the gorgeous rolling horn that we like when in a 10-year-old. But she's got to start out as a 2-year-old. And uh, anyway, that's uh, feel free to anything you want to say about her. She just she's a nice, nice heifer. Well, she's one of the ones, like she said, it's it's that tr that test in patience. We have to learn that um, very early on with the longhorn, because like like she said, she's going to grow up, and you can already see that there's there's going to be some roll in that horn. So you have to be ready for that as well. And just kind of looking at her, she's going to take. Her maturity level, she's, she may take a little bit longer to get there, but that's kind of what she's just showing, and that's where I, I'm going back to that. It's a little bit of a test in patience, but if you have, she will end up being something pretty nice, and most of the time, those ones that you have to wait on a little bit longer, they end up being your most productive and the best cows that you have. I love the line on this cow. You can look and see that she's got an excellent top line. She's got that slope from hook to pins like we talked to earlier. She's not uh, over maturing at this stage. She's nice and clean. Look at that beautiful underline. She doesn't have an extended navel. And I've been seeing more and more of that. It's hard to kind of breed out of them. But that beautiful clean line underneath. The structure on her legs, you can see where she's standing there, that she's not going to be sickle hawk or post-legged. She's got the nice bend in the leg. I agree totally with, with what they're saying about the horn. 
our worst enemy is time. We get in such a rush and think, oh gosh, they're really going to be high. It may take four years for you to start seeing a really beautiful twist out on her horns. And I see heifers that come through sales even today and they get discounted because they have a higher horn like that. And people think, well, she's just going to have big high horns and she's not ever going to have a tip to tip. This heifer's going to have a great tip to tip, I think, by the time all is said and done. Beautiful heifer, beautiful heifer. Very feminine in her head. She's got the long face. You can see her brisket is nice and trim. She looks like a heifer. At this age, she should still look like a heifer. Nice and long. Thank you. Anybody got a specific question or we'll go to the next? This heifer to be is a little rougher in structure, and I think it may be age, and it may be time of year, etc. cetera. Um, wouldn't discount her for anything. She's still pretty clean. Um, she's got a nice shape to her. How old is this heifer? Uh, she's, she's another one that's probably, in this probably 16 months. 16, 16 months, yeah. Uh, 15, 16 months. Beautiful color pattern to her. Yeah, and she's got, you know, now that's the horn shape we all like to see in our, our youngsters. Um, this is a concealed weapon daughter. They tend to have, uh, a lot of them tend to have roll out in that low horn that, that stays out. Um, she is a little, in my estimation, yeah, she's a little rough in the pelvis, but but again, she shows a traditional longhorn mm -hmm. structure. She's not an Angus, no. but I don't breed Angus. So um, in, to me, she looks like a traditional longhorn. And maybe she could have, you know, her, her top line ha is not as stick straight as the red one was before. So yeah, she'll probably end up with a slightly softer top line. But her pelvis is fine. She's got a fish hook tail. She's got decent depth of body for her age. She'll be. She has the maternal uh, qualities. You know that's an important aspect of of lactation and supporting a calf is that depth of body. And so she's she's got that adequate for her age. To me, she's just a little immature still. Just a baby. Just a baby. What? Well, this is how I understand it. And cr feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, because some of you are probably more experienced than me. Feel free to correct her if she's wrong. Yeah, feel free. But my my understanding is that it has to do with, with this shape coming up out. What you don't want to see is the tail that just goes, you know, between the cheeks and just drops straight down, correct? And so um, you want you want to see that, and that's a little a little bump. And so that has to do with the fact that this pelvic this is an easy delivery shape. It's been determined that um, that fish hook tail, along with that little bit of slope that they got, helps them deliver easily. And of course, the Longhorn's famous for that. If we get rid of that, we're idiots. So uh, that that's. What I understand, and you'll see sometimes bigger, more fish hookier looking tails than that. And on this one too, a little bit, the picture can be a little bit deceiving because she'll look like she's a little closer. Her back leg was back. You could see where her muscles carrying a little bit more, and um, you can actually see the the length she has. If her back legs are just a little far forward, if her back legs were back or one was back, it probably looked it would, a little better. It, she'd look a little more balanced. I think the photo probably doesn't portray her as nicely as she probably really is. Y'all take a lot of pictures? If you ever, do you just walk out and say, hey, I need for you to profile for me, and they do? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> After about eight hours. <laughs> Taking, or, yeah. or running a calf the whole time. Right, right. Taking pictures is for a whole nother day of discussion. <laughs> exactly. Because there is a real trick to that. She is posed. That's how you want your picture to look. Head up, one big leg back to show either the udder or testicles if it's your bull. Well, I wouldn't do anything if it's your bull. 
Mm -hmm. That's a security camper ride. Yes. It's not mine. No. It's not yours. Oh, it's not yours? Mm -mm. Well, I'll no. claim it. Yeah. <laughs> is that your heifer? <laughs> Who's that? Oh, oh, is it in the sale? sale? Oh, you okay. doing some promo. Okay, I don't think you should have done that. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think you should have done that. Okay. Oh, well, we know who you work for. <laughs> the heifer does look really balanced, yeah, though. That's a hard one to fall. She's, um, she's got some leg under her, some height, but she's deep-bodied at the same time. Um, it's kind of hard to tell about the, the length of their, of their neck, but she does look like she's got some extension to her neck, which, which does lend femininity to the look of a heifer. I know you've all seen these heifers, and bulls too, but, but a lot of times heifers where their head looks like it just is perched back on their shoulders. Mm -hmm. It's just sitting back there, and there's no real neck, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it takes away from their femininity. It makes them look more bullish because it makes their shoulders look thicker and bigger and their neck look thicker. Hence, it lessens the femininity. But this hef heifer has a real attractive look to me. Um, she doesn't have a lot of skin underneath as far as her, her, her neck and her brisket. She's clean under, under her belly with not a lot of navel. Um, she seems really balanced. She's colorful. Her horn is lateral and looks mm -hmm. like it's it's tipping back, which is which I like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A U neck, it's it's where from their from their let's start at the shoulder. So here's their shoulder. And typically their neck, this let's say this is the point of their shoulder. Typically their neck would be fairly straight and then their head would be attached. A U neck is like a a concave sort of a dip down in their neck just so it doesn't appear to actually be attached correctly and it's just kind of got a little it sort of looks weak and has a little concave kind of a place in it that's my understanding like a u sheep i think right. it's intended Exa as like right a right i think sheep. i i do think that is yep yeah, i do think the terminology comes from sheep because their neck is mm -hmm. sort of shaped that way did you hear that in a show, or did somebody critique, critique an animal and commented on that? Don't know what that is. I'm sorry. Good question. That is a good question. If it were a true profile, and that's a good point, Kim, if it were a true profile picture, you could tell much more about the animal. Mm -hmm. You could see their top line. You could see the slope of their hip. You could see the neck, whether it, how it was attached, and the length of the neck. You could clearly see the dewlap, their underline, uh, the shape of their hock, the way their legs are set under them. Um, but you're right. In order to get <laughs> that view of the horn, we need them to look at us. So if they were looking straight ahead, we wouldn't be able to get that full potential. But if you're really evaluating confirmation, even on longhorns, the best way to do that is with a true side true profile, profile shot. You can tell it's a much more honest picture. Because you can hide a lot of stuff with angles. Right, exactly. So that U neck would be obvious then. It would be a low set neck, generally. Right. And, and it's not attractive. It's right. not attractive in horses, it's not attractive in cattle, and it jump out at you. But it's usually associated with a lower right. a lower set right. that sort of scoops right. up. Ties into their shoulders at a different place, and then instead of being straight, it just kind of goes kind of down, just weakens it. That and I think it may be Terry just the angle because this is sort of a three quarter pose, and you know, and and people love to take these straight on photographs of horns because it makes their horns look bigger, and it makes their body look out of proportion mm -hmm. because the horns look way bigger than their body, and I think when you do a three quarter, which is what this is, if you're not careful, it makes their front end look a little bigger 
because it's closer to the camera mm -hmm. and their and their hind end is further away. So sometimes you'll get a distorted look, and that's what I wonder about this is because of the way the camera's taking the picture, I think it makes her front end look just a little heavier, maybe than it really even is. Right. That's right. Right. That's right. And there's and and there are, and there are females that are that same way, mm -hmm. you know, that are a lot, they're front heavy, you know, they're right. real heavy in the front. Um, I would probably call it undesirable. <laughs> you don't want them to look <laughs> like a steer, and I right. mean, at some point, or a buffalo, getting the big buffalo in the front, front end and, yeah. and narrow in the in the hind end. They, it's just not a. I don't think it's a good, personally, good look. You know, and I, I, when I have people come out to the ranch, I want them to say, oh, wow, look at her, and oh, wow, look at her, and you don't want to have to be trying to shove this one to the back because she, you know, doesn't quite fit the rest. But I agree with what you're saying, and I think it's a three-quarter angle that you've got on this picture. I think if they, you know, they angled that a little bit better, I don't think that she would look like she was a little heavy-fronted that way. I mean, if you look at her stifle here, uh -huh. her belly's deep. Yeah. Quite a bit below, even her little right. tiny, barely yeah. an udder for a heifer is still at her stifle. So yeah. she's not walk wasted. And you, you've certainly right. seen some that are way sucked up. By the time it gets to back to where the stifle is, you know, it's it's inches higher than the stifle. But that's not her situation. She's she's pretty full she's there. Deep. I think it's an angle deal. Yeah. But you don't want females to be so heavy in the front and a lot of that is related to their shoulders if their shoulders are high or real co what I call coarse and I don't know how to describe it any better than that but you'll see their shoulders are sort of raised up and they're very prominent and and typically when they have real prominent shoulders that are coarse oftentimes that comes with some weakness to their back some ease to their back and that just makes the shoulders look even more prominent mm -hmm. That's one of the quickest ways, I think, to take away from the femininity of a, he of a heifer. It's for her to have some big, heavy, rough shoulders and then a little bit of ease to her back. Now, that is a trait I would try to, try to stay away from a little bit because there's really not a lot you can do to correct that. Well... What I think happens over time, Kim, and, and, and you'll know this because you've had cattle for a little while, their top line never gets strong in their whole life. Never gets strong. And that's because, number one, age, but calving, having a pregnancy, delivering calves, having uh, weakness take place, in ligaments and their conformation as they age and as they calve. And, and those older cows oftentimes will have some ease to their back that they didn't have as young animals. And I attribute that to numerous, you know, 10, 12, 15 years of calving. You're just going to see some gradual. That doesn't concern me on an older cow. I cut her some slack there, especially if she's had great babies and, and they're pretty straight, you know, across the top. I think that just comes with it. But when you start out with a young heifer, and she's got a weak top line at a young age, I promise you, if that is important to you, you will not be happy with her as she ages because her top line will never get better. Maybe it will worse. only, with age, get worse. So if you think it's not good to begin with, don't fool yourself into thinking as she ages, it'll get stronger. It will only ever get worse. Well, and that's one of the things. If you see this really jam up baby that's got all the lines, all the looks, the things that you like, mm -hmm. right then and there, and they're growing and they're doing well, but at some point they they have this kind of little staley look, or not quite, you know, maybe it's right after weaning, or at certain genetics do it at certain times. They just have this gangly stage, that teenager mm -hmm. stage. They're going to hit kind of a puberty stage where they're just not going to look quite what you want. But the next month they kind of jump back yeah. into it. They've always yeah, had that structure, that look that you wanted at the beginning. They just have to kind of grow out of it. 
So there's stages of growth mm -hmm. that you have to, you know, kind of watch out for. Um, and maybe not discount some a calf at that time because a month later they're gonna they're just gonna get their bloom back. So that's kind of one of the things you have to watch out for. That's such a personal preference. I have people tell me I wouldn't have a heifer that has any obvious navel. I can't stand that. I just wouldn't have one. I have other people that tell me, oh, a little navel doesn't bother me. I, I think it's just, it's personal preference. I have some cattle that have a little more skin than I like. Sometimes they'll have a little more navel. Sometimes they grow into that. Yeah. You know, they'll have more as a calf and then as they mature, and, and grow. I've had old folks tell me that when they have loose skin, that just means they're going to be a growthy animal, and they got room to grow because they got loose skin. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I hadn't researched you that, what, but I've heard it. It I've sounds it. good to me. Right. It sounds but, good. <laughs> hey. but, I, but I do think navel is a personal preference sort of a thing. With all other things being equal in the show ring, probably some of your judges are not going to like navel and will ding you a little for that. But you know, different people in the show ring, like, it all comes down to kind of personal preference. Now, I mean, you might have some major conformational issues that everybody agrees is a no-no, but people like a certain look. Some people are more drawn to color. They'd rather see a more colorful animal that might not be as perfect conformationally as opposed to a perfectly conformational animal that might be solid red. I mean, it's, a per it's just a personal preference thing. Um, a little navel doesn't bother me. A lot of navel, eh, I don't like. But it's one of those know, things you, just, you don't want to go to the absolute extreme that's right. where it's way too much. But right. you know, there's there's there could be some exceptions, like she said, in your personal preference. Yeah, if it's, that's the only thing about her, and everything else, you know, is here, it doesn't bother me either. Because, and I I kind of followed what you were saying that I think, you know, sometimes it gives them a little more room to grow and to fill out. And, and we've had animals that were born on our place that had a little more navel, and you're looking and going, oh, wow. But by the time that animal's two years old, it has flattened out to a pretty good degree. And I don't want to discount them and, and say, oh, she's got to go, you know, because she's going to be a great producer for me one day because she's got everything else that I like. Everything, all the other things are very good and work in her favor. So I wouldn't discount her because she's got some navel. What you do is with your breeding plan then, when you're looking at potential bulls mm -hmm. to cross her with, you obviously wouldn't want to select a bull that is going to contribute to those factors that exactly. she has that you don't like. So if she has factors, and we'll use navel as example, you would breed her to a bull that is tight-hided, that doesn't have a big pendulous sheath or a lot of navel under there, so that he can help her in those areas where you'd like to see some improvement. And that's across the board, and we hadn't mm -hmm. talked about that. But, but the features that you see, you just have to think <coughs> about that when you're breeding them. You know, if they need strengthening in a certain area and, and some improvement, you don't want to breed to a bull that has the same weakness, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. that your female has. You, you want to do something where it's going to be complementary. And navel is a good example of that. I wouldn't breed her to a bull that's got a big hanging down in there. <laughs> the other thing you have to remember historically, the, the longhorn in his original form, it wasn't really a breed. It, was, it wasn't a, 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 an amalgamation of a lot of different breeds uh, way back. You know, I mean, no one was selecting. They were just turning wild cattle out or using them or, well, it was natural selection. It was just natural selection. So, of course, there's some strains and lines that, that have blood that's more uh, of, of deep ancestral cattle. And, you know, the origins of the longhorn are from Iberia, from the area we call Spain now. Mm -hmm. But it also included North African cattle that were brought up by the Moors into Spain, you know, uh, what, over a thousand years ago. So if those things pop out, 
And I know it's controversial to talk about the fact that there could be blends of other types of cattle in there, but the truth is, is until about 100 years ago, it was whatever anyone kicked out in into the sagebrush ended up in the mix. So we don't know what those were, mm -hmm. and it does pop out here and there as, uh, as things that today we may not um, – include as part of the description of the breed, but it is in there right. from the history and you you can't deny that. So I don't I don't let a little bit of navel here and there um change you know, cause me to get you pull something. Excited. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean but will I pay attention and and not not use a bull that also shows it? Sure, I don't want to make that bigger. But does it hurt them? No. I mean, you know, what everything should have a function. Too much hanging down in our sagebrush could be a problem, yeah. but for a bull or a cow, anything, the pendulous udders, you know, you don't need those getting torn up on sticker bushes and stuff. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. That's What's the first thing you like about this heifer when you look at it? What gets your attention first? Color, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So you know when you have an animal you're going to bring to the show ring or, or breed, color is the something in our something in our breed that, that does sell. You know that. When all other things are equal, that would be the thing that tips the, the weight for you. Got nice lateral horns. Nice long face. Mm -hmm. Very feminine. Got a long back. Right. I think that's what uh, Nancy was talking so about earlier. Thing. Uh, to structure thing and she may have more longevity yeah. than the right. other one mm -hmm. um, she'll hold up a little bit longer than than one than the heifer if she's already got a, showing a little bit of weakness this early then this one who doesn't has a little bit longer just to be able to to do to breed and be in production speaking of production has anybody in here ever had to pull a longhorn calf Me neither. I feel very I feel very good about that. <laughs> I was just gonna <laughs> lean on your experience a little. <laughs> the change in the color based on yeah. Well you won't get a brindle unless you have that. Right. So if if you <coughs> want to increase brindle in your herd, you need to choose for the color genetic package, which is called wild black which allows for the brindle gene to activate, and it'll be a mealy mouth mm -hmm. animal. It may not be a mealy mouth you see until you get real close to them. It's just a tiny little yeah, outline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, that is the – that animal without the brindle gene will be your Parker Brown, uh, sometimes with sort of like dark uh, – almost black body with sort of a reddish line down the back and a, and a little red top knot, mm -hmm. and then they'll have a mealy mouth. That's what tells you it's not a true black. True black will never show brindle if you have a – you could have all the brindle genes in the world come into it, but if it's a true black, it's just going to be black. But if it's this wild black, which has the mealy mouth, then um, then the brindle gene can activate, be activated and show brindle. That can also happen if that calf had been born solid red but with a black nose, yeah. a black switch, black hooves then you know she's not going to stay red. And that is, that's John Randolph's favorite thing. He walks out there and it's <laughs> a red bull. Well, we've got him. But looking at that black nose, we know that we're going to wind up with a bull that's got color other than red. And, of course, black kettle's black. So 
most of ours that are born red wind up being jet black for whatever reason. They don't even look the same in three months as they did when they were born. And so who does that calf belong to? I don't know until they nurse, you know, and then take a picture because my memory sucks. But. Every, every brindle animal and Parker Brown animal that I've ever bred was born red. Yep. Every one of them. Every one of them. Never had one born brindle. I know there are a few that are born with some brindle on it at birth, but most all of them are, will be red at birth, and the Parker Browns will be the same way. And when you show pictures of them as calves, as opposed to what they look like at two years old, you would never recognize them because they begin to change color after they're born. And it is disheartening when you go out there and you've got a pasture full of these solid red calves and you're thinking, how did that happen? Because both the sire and the dam are really brindle or parker brown or whatever. Just be patient. Just be patient. It will change. Because it will change. Have we talked y'all to death? Y'all have any more questions? Here's another. Look at this beautiful heifer. I think if she were standing a little differently, we'd have a little better look at her. I'd like to see the front leg out and the back legs back a little bit and stretch her out some because she looks very short coupled to me in that picture. She does, but I think it's her leg placement. Mm -hmm. Right. The way she's standing. Does look better. No, that's okay. That's a good picture. Mm -hmm. That's a good picture. I hear more squishes better. What? um, My who is sitting out there <laughs> will tell you we look a lot at tails the shorter the tail the earlier maturing they are the longer it is the um, long and thick tail they're going to take a little bit longer to mature but they're going to have a lot more longevity so anything in between you're going to get kind of that moderate but if you look at terminal kettle your angus the ones that, that you're going to breed that are going straight to the feed yards they're going to have a little shorter tail because you're trying to feed out at a certain certain age, certain weight, um, so they're they're going to mature faster and quicker, um, and so that's one of the things that we look at when we're looking at our tails. Um, if they're if it's short and thin, that's not good because you're everything's going to happen really fast, and then you're not going to get as much production out of it um, when when they actually do get into production. But when they've got that longer tail, a little bit thicker, you've got continuous growth, whether it's in their body and in their horn. Um, it's just something that we, we've seen, and he's seen a bunch of cattle. Um, <laughs> so that's, 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 that's where I get my information on that part. Well, we like to see a long switch in our part of the world because we have a, ter- a terrible fly problem. Wow. <laughs> and, yeah. and that's a natural fly swatter, and we like for them to, we like for them to have a good natural fly swatter. It's essential where we live. I think it's okay. It's not. It's 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 not terrible. It's it's a it's a little up there, but I I think it's okay. I don't think it detracts. From I think the yeah. angle she's standing. I think it makes yeah. your pelvic angle look a little flatter than it, it might does. be in real yeah. life. And yeah. you know, you can only judge what you're seeing, so you're just guessing right. that that's the case. But I I think she's got her hips hiked up and she's kind of right. turned, looking back mm-hmm. a bit, and it's distorting that uh, pelvis. I think she's ready to flee. Yeah, she's, <laughs> ready to she, she's perched. Yeah. You know, right. There's a lot of tension that she yeah. has. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. I think we're getting close. Okay. There's a flatter, less fishooky tail. Yeah. She's a nice heifer in mm-hmm. many ways, but I would say that the tail set is a classic. She has a little bit of the navel flap we were talking about earlier, but I'm going to bet that when she was born, it was probably more than what you can see here, and, and she's a good example of a, a good growthy heifer that may be, if you will, absorbing some of that, that navel. Yeah, they do change that. Mm-hmm. 
Well, she's she's got quite a bit of leather there um, at her brisket. Yes, if you look at that, mm -hmm. she's got quite a bit there. And if you really look hard in this picture, you can see starting right behind her bottom lip. Yes. You will see some skin going from there all under um, her jaw, her neck, following down um, all the way through. Just a little extra. Just a little yeah. extra. Yeah. Just a little extra there. Mm -hmm. Not even counting that navel doesn't bother me at all. Mm -hmm. But I find the skin that she's got a little more concerning up front than than the navel itself. I don't like that under her chin at all. It's I'm looking up and seeing if you take a picture of that. But and I and, and I takes away yeah, from and I the, the tail set doesn't doesn't We are, we are, and that's why we're here. It's a nice heifer, one we'd probably all be happy, happy to, to have. have. Yeah. But when we're trying to identify specifics so that your eye can recognize those things, I think you have to do that because what you're saying is, if I were going to try to make a perfect animal, and is there one out there? No. If I were going to make a perfect animal, these are things I would personally try to change a little bit. That's not slamming her. Yeah. That's just saying if you're going to so make her. So you could find a bull with a little, maybe a little yeah. less skin. I mean, right. just in a, in a one-shot repair yeah. mm -hmm. of right. fix those things. Comment? It looks like she's got, she's a little, she's got a little light. Yeah, you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. You might could, like Della said earlier, you know, these young cattle really will change. You know, from the time they're outside and they look like a calf and you wean them, and they look so good when you first wean them, and then they kind of go down a little bit, and then they'll come back up again, and then they'll kind of get gangly or teenage looking, and, and you're thinking, yes, no, yes, no. You know, you might do, I do that sometimes. I'm like, oh, you're not going to make it. And then a week or two weeks go by, and I'm like, well, you know, now you look better. Yeah. It, it is amazing really how they do kind of change as they're maturing and, and growing. And sometimes if you're just not sure, I'd say just give them a little more time. Um, she's not, she doesn't have a smooth, balanced look to me. It, nothing I can just like really put my hand on, but it's just something about her just doesn't look put together quite. And it may just be her age. It could be the photograph. Um, she may just need a little time to, to develop a little bit more. Um, she just doesn't quite have that. A little bit weaker on the top line. Not, not it's just something a, a something line. about it to me that just doesn't quite have that smooth package that that appeals to me. Like, see, if if she were in a group of heifers and I were going through that group and I were like picking one that I wanted, I'd just zoom right past her because it doesn't. It doesn't speak to me and as far as, and that doesn't sound very not knowing her age scientific, too, but <laughs> that's all I can tell. Not knowing what yeah, her and you age don't know how old is, she is. Yeah, fine. I'd like to see a little more extension down there. I'd like to see a little more volume. Right. You see where her tail comes out, and then that hip slopes in. Like what you're talking about when you yeah, I'd like to see just a little more volume there. Not enough to make her bubble butted, but just a little more volume right there. And I, and it may again be the angle and the way she's standing. And yeah, because see, she's not carrying all her muscle right. all the way down she's that not. she could. Because you would carry. want it come. Your arm's not long enough. Do you need a pointer? Right. There yeah. you go. You're right in there. Over yeah. Just to the right. Right in there. 
you would want her to ha- her muscling to come all the way down right there to be a little fuller, and it looks like she's just flatter, lighter muscled through there. I think that would give her a little more balance throughout from the rib back. Well, and see, um, because at her stifle, she she's she not wasp waist, but she's yeah, she's but cut it, but she's cut up high right there. See where her leg and her stifle comes up and joins her belly, where the back leg joins her body right there. See how high up that's cut? Well, that gives like an optical illusion almost that she's not as deep bodied, which she probably isn't. As some of the cattle we looked at, because they on the bottom come straight across, mm-hmm. and their and their body, their belly, right there in their flank joins their leg further down, whereas there it's cut up a little bit. And so it makes her look more narrow. Uh-huh. Right and I think that. she's losing, she's, she's she losing, does. your mm-hmm. eye is right. reading that as, as a mm-hmm. loss. She's right. lost a little substance up there, and it, so it makes, makes it, this it does. seem mm-hmm. narrower and weaker. Right. Now, in a mature cow, her udder would fill that space. Correct. So Correct. that that would correct itself yeah. with age. That may not, again, as Nancy was saying, that may not ever <coughs> look better to your eyes. She'll always be one of those kind of, right. um, you know, that you get that ridge of bone. It never really fills in a lot of meat. Having said that, this is more of a breed characteristic in our cattle mm-hmm. to, see, to see they don't pack deep in, in the old days because of cow pastures like that. So. Um, that's probably a case of maturity time that you're judging. You make a good point about the udder. Yeah. 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 Do we want to take a quick break? Sure. Sure. Thank y'all for coming. <laughs> oh, we'll be back. <laughs> They're done. <laughs> They're done. <laughs> After these messages. Uh, you say you got bulls? There's a few more females that are of different type and kind. Yeah. Somebody threw we should probably say that one. Yeah. Like, like we just showed I'm you sorry. Real quick. Okay. Uh, well, that's what it's about. Yeah. 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 Can I see that picture right there, Justin? Justin, go back one. Go back one. This heifer. This one? No, back a little bit. That heifer right, that heifer. You can see she's got kind of a slope back there. It's pretty big. So she's kind of lost what we would call the fish hook tail. It's not necessarily really, you know, it's, it's hard to critique somebody else's animal. I wouldn't buy that heifer because I don't like the way her back end slopes. Okay. But when we're talking about a fish hook, okay. it's not, you know, you've got the back that comes here, and it's well, just, it it's just a, be a little part devious session. when you've got, it's not. First part, they talk about the period, the second huge, part is like round table where the audience But it is questions. part of and if you need to go the assurance that the reproductive no, no, system, no, no, it's, it's as it should so be, right. and the, the slope from the hooks to the pins is yeah, going to be more okay. like just um, a very okay. gradual so slope, know, and then you've got her tail head coming you can in. Can not. Okay. The hooks to the pins. Let me show you on this picture up here. Okay. Oh. Okay, good. This is what we call, and this is the big bone here. Here, here, because you've got the hook bone here that looks like the jutting out bone here on the hip, and then it slopes down. Hip bone to the butt bone. There you go, hip bone to the butt bone. Excellent. You could have thrown that out. Hers, she's a little. Oh, and the fish hook would be right in here. Am I pointing right out? I can't see. This was, yeah, you can see where the tail would take off and and hook up and over. Yeah. So. She's, you know, Miss Heifer's carrying a lot of weight too. She's she's heavy, but again. So even if, if she stretched out just a slight bit, it would slide her back into that mm-hmm. hole. Do you see that kind of depression? Yeah. Well, 
Well, you want to you want to look to see where you want you want to be fairly level, and of course she's not cut way up, you know, in that back leg. How it's not coming up. That's right. That's right. So she's she is a little narrow up there. But um, are you you're thinking heifer cow? Yeah. Yeah. That's why I wanted you to come down and bite your back because you're going to have to take your hand. I know it's just easy. Mm -hmm. Two minutes. Mm -hmm. And they've cut her off there. <laughs> but I tell you what, though, I watched her come through there when they were doing the measurements, and my husband made the comment, no. I think she's okay. She's as clean. You can see that she's really clean. I don't it is see harder to learn because all this you brisket area yeah, here. I mean, you hear about what's not what's it's desired, but nice you also have to hear about feminine. what's. She's got a good juicy head right here. You can kind of see the juice in here. And yeah, you, yeah, they're they're supposed to have. I wish I could. Okay. <laughs> Okay, look at this. This is it. You see this little divot right here? That's the food pit. And that's good. I'd like to see her. And it may again be the angle of the pit. So I'd like to see this food pit thing a little, you know. But yes, you are exactly right. Exactly right. Not my, not my idea. But I think. Why don't everyone get to touch it? Like I said, some of my eyebrows are pink. But uh, no sound I'll perfect. I'll tell her. I was like, hey, did you know? Did you know? Um, no. This is, is the, are you familiar with this? But it's also pink. So I thought. I think some of the stuff, we, we've kind of put some stuff on the Longhorns to make them be more like what we think of I as a traditional breed. They may have, if you turn them all back out in South Texas for another 200 years, it all might be brass or hip, low back. That might have worked for them there, and we're trying to push them another way.